Humility. It's a really important gift to grow in one's life. And our human nature doesn't like it. Our human nature does not like humility. It seeks to always put us in the limelight. Even, even people who decry the limelight also often do so to draw attention to themselves. Jesus, in our gospel today, he must have had there around him either an infant or, a, or at most a toddler. Because children, by the time they get to seven or eight, have lost any childlike humility they once had. You have only to watch little kids try to take credit for everything to figure that out. They want to push others out of the way. That's what's natural for us to do, to push others out of the way so that we may be seen and appreciated. How many times has a little kid asked you if you liked the gift that he made for you? Over and over and over again, he wants to know just exactly how wonderful it is and how wonderful he is. It's just the way we are. Soon as original sin starts driving us to become like God, that's how we are. Because the desire to be like God is a constant barrage against humility. God, on the other hand, encourages humility and not false humility. When you're really good at something, Know that God has gifted you for it and has given you the opportunity to use it. I know that I am a gifted speaker. I know that God gave me that gift and he started giving me opportunities to grow it and to hone it. When I was really young, 13, 14 years old, and then he, he opened door after door after door, allowing me to continue using that gift, giving me far more opportunities to speak and then, of course, later on to preach than the average person is given so that I could practice and grow. So when you tell me you appreciated a sermon, I don't fake humility by saying, oh, golly, it was nothing, or, you know, it's the best I can do. I say thank you because that's God's gift. That's God using the gift that he gave me and through that gift reaching the hearts of people. I never quit being surprised at what people hear in my sermons. The Holy Spirit works where and when he pleases, and he rarely even lets me in on the process. Real humility is twofold. First, it is recognizing that you by yourself, well, you're just not that great. You are a poor, miserable sinner. And all your best intentions are truly out of selfish motivation. Oh, I know, you can deny it, but you're a liar too, so that doesn't help. <laughs> Our natural state is self-preservation. It's why for the years that I had a school, I used to laugh out loud at parents who would look at teachers and ask, are you suggesting that my child would lie to me? Yes! Of course they lie to you. And you buy into the lie so that you can think more highly of your spawn. Everyone lies to preserve and to protect themselves. Once you have that part down, that you are a poor, miserable sinner, the second part of humility is trusting God. Because He will accomplish through you that which you would never be able to accomplish on your own. We prayed in the collect, God whose strength is made perfect in weakness, grant us humility and a childlike faith that we may please you in both will and deed. That would be a great prayer for you to cut out of your bulletin and paste to the bathroom mirror so that every morning you start your day by asking God for those two important gifts, humility 
and a childlike faith. It reminds us that, that we never want to grow out of humility or to grow out of that childlike faith. Our struggle, in fact, is to grow into Christ-like humility and childlike faith. The more childlike our faith is, the more humble we are. And the more we are like Jesus. True humility is the absolute reliance on Jesus to take care of everything and the determination to serve him while he's doing it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it discipleship. When Jesus first called those disciples, you know, the ones in our gospel who are now arguing about who should be first and who should be last, when Jesus first called them, they left everything everything behind to follow him. They dropped their lives right where they were and walked away from everything to follow Jesus. Now, look how little time it took them to organize their plan for his ministry and to begin establishing a hierarchy that would, of course, serve them. <clears throat> when I was a kid and our family went out to dinner, it never occurred to me to worry about paying the bill. I never checked menu prices to see if whatever I ordered was measured up to the amount of money I had in my pocket as though I would have to pay. I, I just assumed that my father would pay. And in fact, he did. My kids are the same way. They in fact assume that I'll pay for them and everyone they invite along. And they're right. They know that no one pays for dinner when we go out except dad. That's childlike faith in action. Now, interestingly enough, I've noticed a subtle shift going on. Neil, who's in the Navy, you know, a petty officer, has now started reaching for his wallet after dinner. <laughs> and one of the times that we out, went out recently, he got up to go to the restroom and he paid the bill while he was up without me knowing. His childlike dependence on me is coming to an end. And I think I know a little bit how God feels when we decide that we're going to go our own way and that we're not going to depend on him. God wants us to spend our entire lives depending on him. We can have far more confidence in God than any of us ever had in our earthly parents. And while we eventually outgrow our childlike faith in our parents, our childlike faith to solve every problem for us, we strive never to do that with God. Our God is with us every moment of every day. He physically comes into us through the water, through his word, through the body and blood, and being inside of us, if we get out of the way, that is, if we humble ourselves, he is able to do far more through us than we can understand or, or even imagine. <coughs> he is able to work miracles through us. If you had good parents, you wanted to grow up to be like them. And then you got old enough to see their flaws and start taking the good points but move on to your own identity. And then you pulled away completely and became a different person but like them in that you're adults fully functioning in the world. It's different with God. Wanting to be like God, wanting to be a peer of God is the root of our sin. It is what Satan tempted, with us, tempted us with in the garden. For God knows that when you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Our continuous struggle is to stop trying to be God and let God be God in our lives. Psalm 37, that's our introit for the day. King David wrote it. 
he was an old man by the time he wrote it, might have learned a thing or two along the way about humility, if you remember the stories of King David. Listen to what he prescribes. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. Whatever you imagine for yourself is not nearly as amazing as what the Lord imagines for you. Humble yourself before the Lord and then stand back. Only in our humility are we able to let go of worldly things and worldly ideals and walk in Jesus' footsteps where there is true joy and where true glory is to be found.